Good Monday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. Our text comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, beginning in verse 21, where the Bible says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Before we get started today, I want to thank you all for watching and taking part in Beginning the Word. We've covered uh, material throughout Scripture from the book of Proverbs, from the book of Job, from the Gospel of Matthew, and you all have been very supportive of, of what we're doing here. And so I, I deeply appreciate your uh, support and gratitude for us. We also have recognized that this has become an asset to some of you who are homeschooling. I've heard from from some who are who are schooling their children at home that they use this as a part of their daily curricul curriculum for their kids and we could not be more honored that you have um that you have brought us into your home not just in your own personal study but into the study of your family and with that in mind I'm going to spend a little bit of time in our next several videos turning my attention to some of the children who might be watching, who might be listening to this as a part of their Bible curriculum as they're learning from home. And so before we get into this text, I'd like to just give some background information about the Gospel of Matthew, about the teaching of Jesus, how we find it in Scripture, and how all of that fits together. And so if you know this material, bear with me. You can skip ahead to where we start breaking down this text. But if you don't, hopefully this will be a helpful introduction for you. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew is one of four books in the New Testament called a gospel. Now, the Bible, if you open your Bible, you'll see books starting from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Some of the books are lengthy. Some of the books are short. And you'll, you'll notice after you get through the halfway point of Scripture, you come to something called the New Testament. And the first book is Matthew. And if you just start flipping through Matthew and then you go to the next book, Mark, and then Luke, and then John, you'll notice that those books are about Jesus. Those four Gospels of all the books in the Bible, those four Gospels tell the, the history, the accounting, the teaching, the life of Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the four Gospels. Sometimes people will refer to them as the four evangelists, meaning they were the four authors of Scripture telling the story of the Gospel. And so that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As we look at these four Gospels, we notice immediately that Matthew, Mark, and Luke look very similar. And so Bible commentators and scholars have given a name to this. They're called the Synoptic Gospels. If you've ever heard me use that term without explaining what it means, uh, I apologize. And here, here's my explanation for what that term means, synoptic gospel. Let's just break it down into two parts, sun, sin, and optic. That comes from two different Greek words. The prefix sin or soon means with. And optic refers to seeing something with your eyes. And there are English words um, an optometrist is a doctor who works on your eyes. Soon optic, sin optic, refers to seeing something from the same point of view, seeing it together. And so Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Why is that? Well, they tell many of the same events about the life of Jesus, sometimes from a little bit different perspective, sometimes with a little more information than the other, but more or less the same events. And they focus in, in a good part in what Jesus is doing up in Galilee. That's the northern part of the country, Galilee. Now, on the other hand, the Gospel of John focuses more on what Jesus did in Jerusalem. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the synoptics. They tell many of the same things. But John tells other events in the life of Jesus that you don't see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are some overlaps. For instance, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, that's in all four Gospels. The death and resurrection of Jesus, that's in all four Gospels. But for instance, the birth of Jesus, 
That's only in Matthew. That's only in Luke. The temptation of Jesus, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so different accounts of things that go on in the life of Jesus, they're written about by different authors. Mostly Matthew, Mark, and Luke follow the same uh, template, and John is doing something a little different. So that's why we call these the synoptic gospels. They tell it from the same point of view. John tells other things about Jesus, all true, but just uh, details about his life that we don't read in the other gospels. We're here in Matthew, looking at Matthew chapter 18, and we're in, so we're in a synoptic gospel, the first of the four gospels. And so let's now let's jump into our text and see what we can learn here. Peter comes up to Jesus and says, this speaking to him, this is to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? That seems like a fair question. There was, we know from scripture, there was a lot of uh, infighting uh, between the apostles about who would be the greatest. And so Peter asks a question that seems reasonable as, as a disciple who has had problems potentially with other disciples. He says, Lord, how often do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times? Now, Peter probably thinks he is being generous by saying seven times. In fact, there was a, there was a maxim among the rabbis about forgiving someone three times. And so Peter seems to, he, he more than doubles that. He says, should I forgive him up to seven times? And so you can hear the tone of Peter. He probably thinks he's being very forgiving and very generous by saying as many as seven times. But like Jesus does so often in his teaching, he goes far above and beyond what we would expect him to do. The behavior we would expect out of ourselves, Jesus says, you've got to do more than that. Your righteousness, he says, has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees earlier in the gospel of Matthew. And so here he says, I do not say to you seven times. I'm not telling you seven times is good. I'm telling you 77 times. Some translations say 70 times seven. It really doesn't make a difference. The point is Jesus says way more than you think, not seven times, 77 times. Just keep forgiving and keep forgiving and keep forgiving. And so Jesus then tells the parable and the, the, the rest of chapter 18 about this unforgiving servant. And we are only going to look at the first half of the parable today. So tomorrow, come back, we'll look at the second half. But, but this morning, we're looking at just Verses 23 through 27, the first half of the parable of the unforgiving servant. So Jesus says, we're going to compare the kingdom of heaven. We're going to compare it to this parable, to this story. So there are truths within this story that teach us how God expects us to behave as members of his kingdom. And I hope if you are a believer, if you're a Christian watching us this morning, you recognize you are a member of the kingdom. You don't think this is some far out distant thing or some far away place in another part of the universe that you might go to someday, but you recognize that you are part of the kingdom today and the kingdom of heaven has come to earth through Jesus Christ and in his church. And as members of his church, we are members of his kingdom. And what Jesus says is true about the kingdom ought to be true about us. So verses 23 through 27, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to this story. He says there's a king, and as is often the case in, in rabbinic parables, the king will represent God. So there is a king who wished to settle accounts. That is to say, there is a king who is willing or wishing to call those who owe him money into judgment. You've, I've given you money. I've given you time. Let's settle the score. And so he's summoning them before him and they pay what they owe. And so when he begins to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, how much money is that? You probably don't uh, use the word talent to refer to a unit of money. In fact, the word talent means something completely different in our world. But in their day, the word talent referred to a measure of money. In fact, the talent was the highest denomination of money that you could have. The largest denomination of money I've ever seen is a $100 bill. I know there is probably bigger than that, but I've never seen it. So the largest I've ever seen is a $100 bill. And in their world, the largest denomination of money was a talent. The footnote in the English Standard Version says a talent is equivalent to roughly 20 years worth of wages for an average laborer. So if you're a middle-class person working a regular job, 20 years is what it would take you to earn one talent. But Jesus says there's this servant who owes this king 
10,000 talents. Now, the Greek word for 10,000 is the highest number they've got in their language. Now, they had other ways of describing it. You might say 10,000 thousands, but the highest number in, in language was 10,000, myriad. And the highest denomination was a talent. So the point Jesus is making is there is this debt, this amount of money owed, that's the highest number you can think about, that you can imagine, 10,000 talents. And here's this servant, not even middle class. He's a servant and he owes his master, the king, 10,000 talents and he could not pay. He could not pay. And so his master ordered him to be sold, him and his wife, his kids, all that he had, basically bankruptcy plus indentured servitude or forced servitude to pay off this debt and payment to be made. In the ancient world, this was a very common thing. This was not some theoretical practice Jesus is referring to. This is something they knew, they saw, they lived out. They knew that if you had debts that you couldn't pay, you could be forced into slavery. Now, Jesus isn't here saying that slavery is okay or that this type of behavior is right. He's just merely telling a story using a reference that they understood in their world. So he would be sold, his family with him, and all that he had in order to make this payment. And so the servant, given this awful situation facing him, he falls on his knees. He implores. This is strong language. He says, have patience with me. And then he says something here in the second part of verse 26 that's a lie. It's a lie, not necessarily because he intends to lie, but there is no way that he could pay him everything. Just given the circumstances of their day, there is zero chance that this servant could pay everything he could owe to this king, but he's desperate. He falls on his knees. He's begging. He's imploring. He says, please have patience with me. I'll pay it all back. Now the king is smart. The king knows that he can't pay it back. But the king has something for him. He has pity. He looks at his awful, desperate situation and he feels for him. He shows, he feels compassion and he shows compassion. And so the master of that servant does two things. Number one, he forgave him the debt. Now that, that would be remarkable in and of itself. Could have just forgiven him the debt. But he doesn't stop there. He released him. He is now freed from, to, from operating as his servant. You know, the master simply could have said, all right, we'll just keep serving for the next so many years and I'll forgive the debt. But he does more than that. He forgives him the debt and releases him. He frees him from his bondage in, in, as a slave. And so the pity of this king is immeasurable because the debt owed against him was immeasurable. His pity against or for this man was immeasurable. And he released him and he forgave him the debt. Now, the parallel for you and I, I think, is very clear. God is the king. God is the king in this parable. And we are his servants. And we have, because of our sin, accumulated an amount of debt that we will never, ever get to pay. Just can't. God's righteousness is infinite, and so our debt of sin, when we violate his righteousness, is infinite. And no, never in a million lifetimes, lifetimes could we pay back this debt, and yet we fall on our knees because we recognize the gravity, the dire nature of our situation. We fall on our knees and say, God, have mercy on me. And God has pity on us and releases us and forgives us. What an amazing God we serve who looks at us and sees us in our sin, yet has pity on us and compassion. Thanks for joining us today as we've begun in the Word of God. As you have started today in the Word of God, it's my prayer that you'll live out today in the Word of God.